I was a young physician, an idealist, working in rural Kosovo when I first met Remzia. At the time, Kosovo's health and disease, including its rate of tuberculosis, rivaled those of the poorest regions in the world. Remzia was a 34-year-old mother of five. Being busy taking care of her family, she didn't remember exactly when she started coughing. After each stay at the TB hospital, she tried to keep up with her doctor's appointments, but the bus into town was expensive, and after buying her medicines, there was not much money left over. With this being her third episode of tuberculosis, her doctors now considered her a chronic case. The nurses told me she was so thin that they couldn't find enough muscle to inject her medicines. It took us weeks to arrange the testing that confirmed our worst fears that indeed she had multi-drug-resistant tuberculosis. The year was 1996, and everyone, from her local pulmonologist to the World Health Organization, declared it too difficult or too expensive to treat multi-drug-resistant TB in a low-income setting, a heinous inequity that was proving deadly around the world and right in front of me in Kosovo. I arranged for, with the international organization I was working with, I convinced them to purchase her medicines overseas and ship them to us. We arranged for her admission to the TB hospital. I watched as she hugged and kissed each of her children goodbye before getting in the car with us. I looked away so she wouldn't see that my heart was breaking too. She was 34 years old, just a year older than I was. I couldn't imagine the courage this took. I followed her closely, but in the many layers of her tragic story, first the medication shipment was delayed, and then when it did arrive, it contained only two of the four medicines that we'd ordered. She felt better for a while on her new treatment, even enjoyed a visit with her family. But when one of her medicines had to be discontinued due to intolerable side effects, we saw her worsen, become weaker, more short of breath. She died quietly one night in isolation. I visited her home a few days later, bringing her family some food, our usual response to grief. Her family told me they were proud how she'd tried to fight the disease and appreciative of all that we'd done. I apologized for Remzia's unnecessary death, for leaving her husband a widow and their children without a mother, though really I was apologizing for all the inequities that result when some lives are considered more important than others. On that day in a village in Kosovo, I made it my life's mission that I would never have to see a young TB patient kiss their children goodbye for the last time. But it would be another 14 years before I fully understood what fulfilling that mission would entail. In the intervening years, tuberculosis became my area of specialty, and my desire to eliminate the disease burned just as strongly as it had in 1996. The field of global health had emerged with its focus on social justice and promoting health for all people worldwide. In the TB world, we now had an arsenal of tools to help us, from free medicines to a treatment strategy to widespread political will. In 2009, I found myself in Tanzania working with the Ministry of Health on a high-profile project to develop clinical guidelines for children with tuberculosis. With advocacy for TB in children largely absent from the global public health agenda, pediatric TB had become a neglected area of child health. I was excited to bring attention to this issue and to the one million children that develop TB each year. And because these guidelines were to be the first in the region dedicated to children, many neighboring countries were watching us, standing by, ready to follow our lead. I entered this project with great aspirations of addressing a grave global health disparity. Yet what I learned was not at all what I expected, and it's changed everything I do since. My US team and I began this work with the best of intentions. Years of experience working in East Africa, mutually agreed upon goals with our Tanzanian partners, and so we thought a timeline for the project. We returned home, and we dug right in doing our background research and generating outlines. I ignored the first warning signs when communications with our Tanzanian counterparts seemed to break down. Instead, my team and I forged ahead alone, churning out first, then second, then third drafts. Surely our, our partners would catch up. Even when they emailed me to say that they were ditching our draft, which they had no investment in, I still thought I could fix this. We'd work through our allies and get back on track. 
But when I reached out to the Tanzanian partners who knew us best, they were suddenly too busy to collaborate and seemed to be running in the opposite direction as fast as they could. I panicked. I'd never had a project unravel like this. So I got on a plane. At dinner with a trusted Tanzanian colleague, now face to face, he spoke honestly with me. Despite our shared commitment to children with tuberculosis, this project was falling apart because we had inadvertently steamrolled the partnership. In our desire to produce and deliver, we lost sight of who and what mattered most. We needed to slow down and better understand our partners and their priorities. And we needed to reassess our own actions and behaviors as overbearing and paternalistic as they were. Because good intentions were not, nor will they ever be, enough. I realized then that if equity and health is my life's mission, equity and partnership is the means to achieve it. So here I am today to promote a new paradigm for, for establishing our global partnerships, one that is based squarely on equity, a leveling of the playing field, giving everyone what they need to be successful in an unfair world where too often borders, history, and power prevent this. Now, equity is particularly important when partnerships are forged across a great income divide, when institutions such as Dartmouth from high-income countries partner with those in low-income countries. Because that's when we bring our seemingly limitless resources, our privilege, our monochromatic Western lens, and our singular language to this work. And without this awareness, we risk unknowingly replicating the very inequities we seek to mitigate. And the unintended consequences of doing so can be disastrous. From partnerships that are unequal and exploitative in both blatant and subtle ways, to squandered resources on projects that are never sustained beyond the pilot phase, to US-driven solutions that detract from actual community needs, to the dangerous phenomenon of students from elite universities without clinical training feeling it's OK to do what they would never be allowed to do back home, to prescribe medicines, to deliver babies, to assist in surgeries. If we don't get this right, we risk individual harm, eroded trust, and continued disempowerment. And frankly, it's time we stop learning these lessons on the backs of our low-income partners, their families, and communities. It's time that we bring equity not just to the program goals, but to the partnerships themselves. And I invite all of you to join me in doing this. Let's change how we collaborate and engage globally. Now, how might we do this, you ask? Let me offer three ways to get us started. First, we need to deconstruct or decolonize our global partnerships. In an editorial in the medical journal The Lancet, Richard Horton plainly asks, is 21st century global health just a polite way to decorate these repackaged colonial ambitions? We need to stop and ask ourselves, are we empowering communities or are we building our own CVs? Do we ask our partners what matters most to them or do we seek input on plans that we've designed for them? We need to examine how colonialist attitudes permeate every aspect of our global work, from our approaches, to our program metrics, to the language we use. As the philosopher Paulo Freire said, language is never neutral. So if we aim to decolonize, we need to stop using disempowering words like help, let, or allow. Just last year, I was showing a slide in which I was touting our partner-centric approaches by saying, we let our partner's priorities drive our agenda. But did you hear it? Who are we to let? or allow. Similarly, we need to unlearn our assertive behaviors that are rewarded in US boardrooms and elite college classrooms to become better followers and listeners. A colleague of mine instructs his students of global health before they travel overseas to first do no good, a concept that forces us to slow down and stop pushing our own agendas, because that's when we risk driving a wedge into the partnership which can lead to the recoiling that I experienced in Tanzania. Second, we must strive to understand context. We must delve into the historical legacies and complex social and economic forces that are driving today's disparities in the places where we work. 
we must recognize that context is neither static nor one-dimensional. Another colleague of mine shows her students a picture of an impoverished urban courtyard that could be anywhere in um, Mumbai or Nairobi or someplace in between and asks if they want to work on a public health project there. Oh yes, they respond enthusiastically, we could be helpful there, we could make a difference, we could have an impact there. Yet when shown a similar scene of urban poverty in inner city Baltimore, Los Angeles, the students decline, saying, the work there would be too difficult, the problem's too deeply entrenched, there's no way we could have an impact there. Now what's the difference between these two settings? Surely the problems and challenges in Mumbai or Nairobi are as deeply entrenched and complex? The difference was solely in the students' greater understanding of the US context. The writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie warns us of the risk of oversimplifying as the danger of a single story. Our willingness to fit that which is foreign into a single narrative about a country or culture or class. Yet not all Tanzanians are mired in poverty. Not all rural Chinese are illiterate farmers, just as not all Americans are obese and gun-toting. Similarly, we need to drop the single-story assumption that everything we do in a high-income setting is better or preferred. In fact, we may be less innovative and more wasteful because we can be. We need to reject all these single stories and dig deeper to find a mosaic of stories. My third recommendation is to practice reciprocity. We've seen that turning the tables can be very enlightening. At Dartmouth, we launched a bilateral medical student exchange with our partner institution, Muhambili University in Dar es Salaam. After the Tanzanian students' first week here, my medical colleagues approached me to say, Lisa, this is really hard. The students arrive and they don't know our healthcare system, our hospital, our medical record, or how we get things done. We have to orient them to everything. Now, what could I do but smile at the irony here? We had been sending our students to Muambili National Hospital for years to refrains of how brave, how noble, they're going to help, without realizing that our students would arrive and find themselves in exactly the same situation, needing to be oriented to everything by our Tanzanian partners. Only by practicing reciprocity did we come to understand the burden we'd been placing on our international hosts, and then could begin to pay it forward. Most importantly, reciprocity ensures that we equalize opportunities across the partnership. Now, this is not done often enough, but is true equity in action. Now, taken together, these three steps will allow us to move from initial changes in attitude and language to the structural changes that will transform our programs and policies. These days, my global partnerships are firmly grounded in equity. In July 2012, I arrived in Kigali as the first U.S. physician to help launch the Rwandan Human Resources for Health program, a multidisciplinary project enlisting U.S. schools of medicine, nursing, and health management to help rebuild Rwanda's health education system. From the start, it was clear that this was a Rwandan-led program. The then Minister of Health, Dr. Agnes Benigua, who kept us focused on developing Rwanda's human capital. When we asked, can we bring our U.S. students here to train, the response was, how will that help our Rwandan students? Might it distract from their training? When asked, can we initiate research projects here, the response was, as long as you provide Rwandans research authority, data ownership, uh, publication co-authorship, and while you're at it, could you publish in open access journals so that we can actually download the articles about our very own research? When my U.S. colleagues wanted to impose American standards or protocols, I helped them to back down so that all solutions could be Rwandan-driven and owned. Rwanda is offering us a new paradigm, but it shouldn't be incumbent upon them to do so. As their partners, we should be prioritizing the benefits to their students and their workers and their communities. In the past, I've seen low-income partners end relationships with wealthy U.S. institutions when they took a one-sided approach, reaffirming that dignity and respect will always matter more than money or status. 
Returning to my own partnership mishap in Tanzania, I'm glad to say I was not kicked out of the country despite our mistakes. I'm forever grateful to my Tanzanian colleague whose candor allowed me to rethink our actions and rebuild the relationship. We stopped trying to impose our American method of guideline development on our partners. Ownership went back to the country team. And in the end, we produced guidelines that could best serve the children of Tanzania. We were exceptionally lucky. Going forward, our partners may not be so understanding, and in fact, I hope the expectations will be higher. Which is why I call on all of us here today to commit to equity in our partnerships, to radically shift our language, attitudes, and practices so that neither power nor pity determine our ability to collaborate. Let's make this our mission, because if we want to live in a world where all lives matter, we can only do this together as partners. Thank you.